I gotta make it official and bring my hat out. Can't do it without the hat, my gosh. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you're very kind. That's wonderful remarks from uh, the mayor and nice of him to take the time to meet with all of us tonight. I hope you'll enjoy our show. That was a great presentation. Uh, my presentation is somewhat similar because we're covering a lot of history in St. Louis. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to travel through time from the 1850s to the 1970s as we review river traffic, trains, cars, buses, streetcars, and aircraft. So hold on, we're going to take quite a ride. That is a daguerreotype there. Uh, it's an image of our riverfront in 1852. Two was taken by the famous photographer Thomas Easterly, 22 years before Eads Bridge was built. There was a lot of smoke from that forest of stacks and plenty of noise and activity as the river was our connection to the world and the steamboats were our state-of-the-art form of transportation and also for passengers in shipping. From 1961, we see this vessel, uh, the USS St. Louis. It's the first steam-propelled river ironclad which was built at James B. Eads Union Marine Works in Carondelet. In 1883, this is the ornate ladies' cabin of the luxury steamer City of St. Louis. It didn't last that long because 20 years later, the boat was destroyed by fire while at dock in Carondelet. The Streckfuss steamer line is the best known in the annals of St. Louis, and here we get a glimpse of a race between two Streckfuss excursion boats, the Queen St. Paul and the J.S. Deluxe. Rivers were once the main way to move freight to get passengers from one town to another to ferry people and later even trains. And as times changed, our river steamers would be primarily for excursions, though the barge business today remains a very major form of transportation. That's a showboat. That's not the Goldenrod showboat. This is almost a twin of that floating theater. It's the new sunny south that was on the Ohio River. And here is the Goldenrod showboat, uh, at least a placard promoting what the showboat did. Uh, the, it's a promotional card and extolling the virtues of the theatrical performances on the Goldenrod, which had a seating capacity of 600. It was touted as being the last of a long line of monarchs of the mighty Mississippi on which you cheer the hero and hiss the villain. The Goldenrod, which is a nationally registered landmark, is today forlornly on an inlet on the Illinois River near Campsville, sort of waiting for someone with maybe about two or three million dollars to come along to bring it back to life. It's possible that it'll happen to you. Captain Menke, J.W. Menke, lived on the Goldenrod showboat ever since it came to St. Louis. It was uh, to be permanently moored here in 1937. All right, now that is an interesting vessel. Uh, it's a huge side-wheel steel-hulled steamer. It's called the Albatross, which was built in 1907 to be a railroad ferry at Vicksburg, Mississippi. It was purchased by Streckfuss Steamers in 1937 and came to St. Louis where, with an all-new superstructure, it became our famous SS Admiral. Speaking of the Admiral, here she is on her maiden voyage on the 12th of June in 1940 when there was a railroad trestle west of Wharf Street, railroad track on Wharf, and the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial Project had yet to get underway. Uh, let's relax in the air-conditioned comfort of the sleek SS Admiral Lounge. The Admiral, as a steamer, was propelled by side paddle wheels that were operated by twin Pittman arms that you could see the arms in the first deck arcade. These arms, which are on display in the Museum of Transportation, had the nicknames of Popeye and Wimpy. Now here's a sneak peek inside one of the four ladies' powder rooms on the Admiral, and each had a name as well as a unique design. There was Sonia for ice skater Sonia Henney, and she's also a movie star. Deanna for the singer and movie star Deanna Durbin. Greta for movie star Greta Garbo, and the other was simply called Glamour. The SS President, which spent most of its life doing excursions in New Orleans, was built here in St. Louis on the levee in 1933. The President, which came back to St. Louis from 1985 to 1990, is now dismantled and, I understand, lies in a farmer's field near Effingham, Illinois. One of our guests tonight is Tom Dunn, who was with Streckfuss Steiners for many years. He now manages the Gateway River excursion boats, and I know the bookstore is not open tonight, unfortunately, but he's written a new book, and it's called The Admiral, 
Uh, it's all about the Admiral, so hopefully you'll get a chance to buy that book at some point. I know you'll enjoy it. <laughs> This from 1934 is what was called the Wicker Lounge on the side wheeler president, both the exterior and interior of the boat, designed by Maisie Krebs. Maisie was a famous bar fashion illustrator and decorator, and she did such a good job, she immediately got the commission for the design of the Admiral, just a few years later, 1937. From St. Paul to New Orleans, breakfast steamers were noted for having the latest and best music on the river. This is a band on the president. I'm not certain of the band leader's name, but I am pretty sure it's not Bob Cuban. The train came next. So let's hit the rails with a look at a mighty Missouri Pacific steam locomotive circa 1877, complete with cow catcher, as they were called. It's from a time when airplanes and flying cars were pure science fiction because there were no airplanes or cars of any kind. Here's a steamy shot that we see of the Mopac Scenic Unlimited or Scenic Limited as it chugs in the Gray Summit Tunnel in 1932. That's when steam was still king of the railroads. 1951 photo of the Missouri Pacific train station on Vandeventer, just north of Tower Grove Avenue. There was also a Frisco passenger station at the corner of Vandeventer and Tower Grove. That sign to the left is for the Nash Missouri Corporation, a car dealership at 2323 South Kings Highway. Nash was a famous car of the past and maybe a car called Tesla might be a famous car of the future. Our time travel log drops us off at Union Station, 1945, when it was a very happy place as our men and women in uniform were starting to come home from World War II. There's the Great Hall, the Grand Hall of Union Station as it looked in 1895, basically looks the same today, 119 years later. This massive room it was at its worst gained notoriety when it was the site of the ring for the fight scene in the 1981 movie Escape from New York. What we have here is a special October 25th, 1945 menu of the Mark Twain Zephyr Luncheon that was in Hannibal to honor the 10th anniversary of the Burlington Road's Mark Twain Zephyr passenger train. Some of the Twain-themed items were Life on the Mississippi Catfish and Mysterious Stranger Potatoes. This event was 26 years before we would have Amtrak. Let's go back to the Union Station for 1905 and a look at the Midway at Union Station. This view looks to the west to 20th Street with the head house or terminal to the right and the train shed to the left. Hats, obviously, were very big and there were no tank tops, shorts, or flip-flops to be seen. Closing for the Cambria is Union Station itself in 1907. The major changes you'd see today are that that round section at the corner of the building on the right is gone, as are the telephone poles and the buildings in the foreground that were replaced by the Carl Miller statues, the wedding or meeting, if you prefer, of the waters. In that same long ago year of 1907, this is a glimpse of the train shed. It still looks about the same today. The trains always backed into Union Station. Now, a quick visit forward to how Union Station's Midway appeared in 1959. Physically, little has changed other than the addition of, of fluorescent lights and some modern stands. Here's the Wabash Railroad Streamliner City of St. Louis. It's in 1946. It's making its way through Forest Park, headed to the Del Mar Station at Del Mar and Hodemont. Little did they know that something called Metrolink would someday use this very path. The automobile is next on our transportation travels, and 10 years after our World's Fair, the car had become so popular that the Ford Motor Company built this five-story factory at the southwest corner of Forest Park and Sarah, and continued using it until 1943. Today, it's known as the West End Lofts. This is a 1941 shot of the General Motors Chevrolet Motor Division, Fisher Body Plant at Union and Natural Ridge. One year later, due to World War II, Civilian auto production would shut down until the end of the war. St. Louis had some locally owned automobile companies. Uh, they weren't all national companies. We had Gardner, Moon, Doris, and others. This is a 1909 Doris fording a stream, which in those days was actually not that unusual. Here's a 1916 Ford built in St. Louis over in Forest Park Avenue in front of a building at 4139 McPherson, and it's employing the use of tire chains to make it through the snow and ice. Now for some commercials. One's an ad for the Knox four-cylinder waterless car and for the Lozier 40 and 50 horsepower car from my Ronda Motor Car Company, 4230 Olive. In 1964, when that address was on Gaslight Square, it was home of Marty's, a nightclub owned by singer Marty Bronson. 
And there's also an ad for metal, bright car polish, and for non-kicking cranks. In a direct mail campaign, they did it then too, as they do today, briefling, quality carriages and wagons are pitching their hand-built oak and steel vehicles to the once-famed Spec Confectionery. That was a restaurant at 414 Market. That was in business from 1848 to 1958. And it's time to fill her up. This is actually America's very first filling station. It's a bit different than the QT of today. This tiny station opened in 1905. It was on Teresa, just south of Market. Highway 40, I-64 now covers that spot. It was first operated by a firm called the Automobile Gasoline Company, and in 1929, Shell Oil bought the place. Uh, you don't see this anymore. It's an inside view from the car of a dedicated standard service station attendant cleaning a windshield. This is from April 25th, 1936, and with tax, gas was a whopping 19.7 cents a gallon. We take you now back to a place that's still around today, though at least for now the building is empty. This is how the Jefferson Hotel on 12th Street, now Tucker, looked. It's when cars had yet to run the horses off the streets, but that wouldn't be long before that would happen. Case in point, we have here a couple of horses in 1905 that are not too pleased with the look and sound of that passing automobile. We always hear about horsepower as it relates to cars, but we now have a picture of some real horsepower as six teams of horses are moving a house that's been placed on wheels. Pretty soon this man, Dr. Dittinger his name, would put away his buggy whip and take his family for a Sunday ride in a car he'd build himself. This shot was snapped on the 30th of July in 1897. Buggy and carriage wheels were becoming passe as balloon tires that frequently required repairs or replacing were what the newfangled car needed. This is a tire repair truck ready to hit the road outside of the H. Bender Firestone Tyler Tire Dealership, which was at 4388 Olive Street. Well, to keep up with the times and the crimes, our Metropolitan St. Louis Police Department started to be motorized with this, their very first police car, with a contingent of officers. They are all set to go after a red light camera violator, I'd imagine. Uh, there's a happy group of fun-loving guys and gals with their cars taking a ride out in the country in 1914. That's a place called Oscar Brackman's Roadhouse, complete with an Anheuser-Busch sign way out on Manchester. What we have here, an interesting car, a 1904 Knox with a mother-in-law seat in the front. Unfortunately, with a quick stop and no seat belts, uh, you can imagine the consequences. We see Mrs. and Mr. and Mrs. J.F. Kraft out for a 1901 Joyride. This is a steam buggy that the crafty Mr. Kraft converted, and the steam engine and boiler are behind the seat. This is an actual auto accident in 1907. It is a real wreck. I wonder if the airbags deployed on that thing. Not much left of it. From 1907, Major Roy Britton and S.S. Prim, they were early car enthusiasts, are relaxing in their snazzy Thomas 40 Roast Roadster. This was at the end of the first annual Owner's Reliability Tour, which covered 85.5 miles through St. Louis. Roy was president of then brand new auto club the AAA. And here are the owners of the Doris Motor Carriage Company, George Doris in front, Jesse French in back, who also built pianos. They're in a 1902 Doris racing and touring car. The main Doris factory was at Laclede and Sarah, still there today, it's now the Doris Lofts Condominium. And we now see A.L. Dyke seated in the back of this 1903 Pope Toledo, which, by the way, was not the forerunner of the Pope Mobile. The cars in front of the original location of Dyke's Auto Parts Supply House, which was actually the very first business of its type in the USA, located at 2109 Olive. The latest computerized automotive diagnostic equipment was not quite available at the McNish Auto Repair Shop, where we find the original Mr. Goodwrench hard at work. The shop was at 3667 Olive, Channel 9 is at that location today. What we have here from 1906 is not the first drive-in office, but the showroom and office of the Van Automobile Company, which distributed the Marmon make of cars. They were built in Indianapolis. The Marmon was the first winner of the Indianapolis 500 and also the first car that had a rear view mirror. This is the 1909 Rambler. 
in front of the Kingman Implement Company, 2600 North Broadway. These folks in the car are long gone, but if you were headed that way, you would see the building there. Kingman is long gone, but it looks the same today. Early on, the city of St. Louis found a way to make money licensing cars, and for an easy way to see if you paid the tax, they issued window stickers, such as this one from 1934. Here's a 1902 picture of a special car of the St. Charles and Western Railroad Company taking orphans and their chaperones to a picnic. Now, this is Olive Street looking west from 7th Street, the year 1900. Building on the right with the round windows uh, is the 705 Olive Building today. The one past it is the Chemical Building, which is still there today. We stayed downtown but moved to 1929 at a block south for a view of Pine Street looking west from Broadway. About midway on the left is the then St. Louis Globe Democrat Building, and in the distance on the left is the Southwestern Bell Telephone Building at 1010 Pine, which was built in 1926, and the city had yet to find out they can make some money on parking meters. This, in 1925, is how the busy intersection of Shoto, Van Deventer, and Manchester appeared. Very soon, Shoto and Manchester would be part of Route 66. In those days, streetcars covered a lot of territory in the city, and they're probably going to be back again. Speaking of streetcars, here from 1930, we have the public service company Car, Yard, and Barnes, 39th and Park. This is of the streetcar strike. One of our biggest strikes was the streetcar strike of 1900, when strikers would put trash and garbage in the tracks and threw anything they could in the overhead wires to keep the cars from operating. This image is looking north on North 23rd Street from Sullivan. That's the Hyde Park Brewery, one of the great breweries of St. Louis, way off in the distance. Now here's that accident at Butler Brothers at 18th and Olive Street. Uh, that building is still there. Actually, the Butler Brothers sign is still there as well. A big change in one mode of transportation was underway in 1896 as mule-drawn streetcars were sent out to pasture by the electric streetcar. In 1903, something called trackless trolleys got a try but didn't succeed. This one's on North 20th between Cass and O'Fallon and that's the St. Stanislaus Catholic Church. <laughs> Well, as cars were taking over, are getting around, here's a view of our biggest parking lot ever. Today, it's the location of the Gateway Arch Grounds. Here it is, just after all the buildings were raised. Uh-oh. Looks like trouble. Tough break for a jaywalker. Actually, this 1905 Pierce Arrow was used in this staged accident to demonstrate the danger of driving over the speed limit, which at the time was seven miles an hour. Even the fire department was phasing out horses. This is a locally made 1916 Doris fire engine. They're at 3300 Locust. The building with the arch windows is still there. A three alarm fire at Vandeventer and West Pine in 1945 was answered by this 1939 Seagraves pumper that unfortunately got into a fender bender. This is a promotional shot from 1940 in front of Soldier's Memorial of a hook and ladder truck coming to the St. Louis Fire Department by the Rio Company. Now we saw a car with tire chains earlier. Now here in 1937, we see a St. Louis dairy driver attaching skid chains on his horse's hooves. And here's a sample of a much larger dairy truck. This is a Peebly Dairy 1925 Mack tractor with a Fruhoff trailer. And this is the new car garage of the Van Automobile Agency in Locust in the area that would become and still is known as St. Louis's Automobile Row on Locust, uh, just east of Grand and west of Jefferson. Unfortunately, this car didn't have all-wheel drive, so it needed two horsepower to help it get unstuck back in 1907. This is definitely the most famous photo of any St. Louis-made car. It's silent movie star Clara Bow, the It Girl, perched on the hood of a 1919 moon. From Kokomo, Indiana, we have a 1909 chauffeur-driven Haynes on Pine Street, the chubby cheek passenger had wanted a bottle of ABC beer, but he and the driver were looking for the wrong way when they passed that tavern in the background. Darn it. It's of interest to note that at this point, every car we featured has not had a solid hard top. Here's a classy magazine ad for a seven passenger Doris touring car. You needed to reach inside to open the doors. The car cost $2,550, which was big bucks in 1914. From 1930, it's a shiny new yellow cab. 
No lift cars in those days, and of course none yet in St. Louis. Here's our first featured enclosed car made in St. Louis, the Windsor White Prince from 1929. Unfortunately for the White Prince, the Depression came along and this brand quickly died. We have some rapid transit riders boarding a St. Louis bus company bus headed to Morgan Ford, Kings Highway in Loughborough as a streetcar on the right waits its turn to get by. Soldiers and civilians getting on a People's Motor Bus Company double-decker following a patriotic rally in Forest Park. Another local car manufacturing company was the St. Louis Motor Carriage Company. This is their factory at 1211 North Van Deventer between Cook and Page. Signs bear the automaker's slogan, Rigs That Run. In this shot from 108 years ago, that statue of Frank P. Blair, which is still there at Lindell and Kings Highway, is looking toward the Bixby Estate, now site of the Chase Park Plaza. The car was a success model made in St. Louis. Here's another peek into downtown's past, this time from Sixth and Olive looking north. The year was 1920. Let's take to the air. That's what former President Theodore Roosevelt is about to do. It's 1910, T.R. is straightening his tie before pilot Arch Hoxie, whose back is to the camera. Teddy was the first American president to fly in an airplane. Lambert Field, 1920, looks a little bit different than it does today. And these are two militarily clad gents at the 1919 Army-Navy balloon races at Priesters Park, which was a huge place at Grand and Merrimack. Their stands would hold 50,000 people. In 1923, workers in the Railway Exchange Building got quite an eyeful as daredevil Marie Meyer stood in the wing of her biplane as part of the air show of her Marie Meyer Flying Circus. And it's back to Lambert for a plane's eye view of the terminal. This is on the east side of what was then Route 77, or Denny Road, then that name was changed in 1930 to Lindbergh. From 1921, it's the Greater St. Louis Endurance Ship. Now, this is one of those St. Louis to Chicago mail planes that Lucky Lindy would drive. Oh, Ryan Aircraft, the maker of Charles A. Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis, came up with a great novel concept for the traveling businessman. As soon as we get the cars that drive themselves, this would work with this today. It was advertised as a flying office complete with typewriter, adding machine, pencil sharpener, ink wells, blotters to works, but unfortunately, no Wi-Fi. This is a TWA plane loading passengers and baggage at Lambert in 1935. I wonder if they had to take their shoes off for a security check. Here in St. Louis in 1960, McDonnell Aircraft was building the E-4 Phantom Fighter. Speaking of McDonnell, that is James McDonnell himself as a test pilot in 1947. And this is the original McDonnell Phantom, named the Spirit of the Sky, our shot is from 1945. McDonald's Bob Elwins in the right, the other man was test pilot Woody Burke, who was killed in a, a plane crash. This is the first Lockheed Constellation here, the Connie, taking off at Lambert for Trans World Airways. The Naval Air Station is off to the right. In 1962, we have the Mercury 7 astronauts posing with the McDonnell Mercury space capsule, and no, they didn't all get in at one time. Back on terra firma in 1950, here's a look at some young soapbox derby drivers. Incidentally, this still goes on. I just had it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it happens every year on the hill on Mackland. Here's an interior of an Olive Street streetcar in 1933 where there were plenty of advertising cards to keep you reading and busy as you rode along. From 1952 and 53, we have the back of a St. Louis Public Service Company student ID holder, blue for boys, red for girls, and as we're ready to head to the future with our friend Sean Light, let's board a bus using this November 52 student pass. And that's our trip to the past. Thank you very much. <laughs>